future, talk radio will actually educate, inspire, and make you think. The future is now. Topics and music that affect your life from Universal Broadcasting Network. Tune in at ubnradio.com. Hey, everybody. You and I go hard at each other like we go in the Good day, everybody. Welcome to another edition, another really fun edition of What's Up with Cobalt and Friends and another great show. And uh, Kurt, you know, our producer, Misty, is in labor. It's yeah, like a countdown. Countdown. What's she going to have? Well, we all know what she's having. But oh. when's she going to have the little guy? So we're all excited. So I'm hoping that during the show, we'll hear a little bit from Misty and her husband and the little guy. I'm hoping that he makes an appearance. So Misty, if you're listening, let us know. Okay. So another great show right now in studio. We have actor and from Italy, but living in the United States for yep. many years. And his latest movie, The Homeless Billionaire. Correct. Victor Alfan. Alfieri. 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 Okay. I am Italian. I should know how to pronounce it, but I warned you that you know this would be a, a, a little issue with me. So uh, thank you for being here in studio. You're welcome. We're going to be talking to you about your film. Uh, you're going to be sort of joining me as a bit of a co-host, so that'll be really fun sure. to hear what you have to say about all this kind of stuff. Because uh, right now on the phone, we have our first guest. Kara, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Kara Masek, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. You are the communications director for the Governor's Highway Safety Association. Right? Yes, that's okay. correct. And I love what you're here to talk about. You're talking about um, selfies, as you're taking selfies behind the wheel, correct? How yes. dangerous that's become. Yes, um, and how prevalent, too. Yeah, why don't you tell us, tell us a little bit about, about that and, and the increase in accidents from selfies, which I find to be completely ridiculous. How can you be driving down the highway and taking a selfie of yourself? I mean, yeah, maybe, they, maybe they do it on TV, but, you know, usually it's in a film where someone's driving the car for you. But how can you be sitting there going like this and taking your picture? Very dangerous. Do you do this, Victor? Uh, no, no, I do it now. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> we we'll take it now. Uh, but go ahead. I'm not trying to make so, light of this, but it's serious, it, serious it's issue. A, it's a real serious issue, yes. Um, and it's, it's one that, you know, unfortunately common sense doesn't play a big factor in driving behavior. And we, we know this through... You know, people still drunk, drive drunk, um, yeah. you know, way more often than they should. People still don't buckle up. Um, we've made great progress in both of those areas, though. We've kind of changed the culture. Um, but with the proliferation of uh, technology and the, um, you know, need for everyone to stay in touch at all times, it's, it's become a big, a, a real tension there between the importance of driving and being safe on the road and the, you know, the, the fun, you know, selfie culture, the culture to, to, you know, be in touch with your friends all the time, especially for the younger folks. So uh, it's, it's really a deadly combination. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of great data in terms of the actual, you know, crashes and fatalities caused by a lot of these behaviors, just because, quite honestly, there's no, you know, distractilizer test where you can, you know, necessarily find out what was going on at the moment of impact where you can with, with drugs or alcohol through, you know, toxicology reports. So, uh, but it's a real big uphill battle and one that, you know, we as an association and our members are fighting every day. Well, AT&T actually did a study. Did you see that? It's called the yes. I Can't Wait campaign that they're involved mm -hmm. with. You know about that, obviously, right? Yeah, we're very, actually, we're partners with AT&T's It Can Wait campaign and, and, and really strong supporters of it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and it says, listen to this, uh, four out of ten people are using social media while they're driving. What are they doing? Are they on their wow. Facebook accounts? And seven out of ten are texting and sending and receiving emails. I will tell you, I'm guilty of this sometimes. My kids will be in the car and I'll say, you're going to kill us. Put the phone down. They are better at it, but of course, right? You know, yeah. Riley's in here laughing, our publicist. He's laughing, saying, "Yeah, no kidding. They're gonna, they're gonna be mad at you, Deborah." But it's true. They will say, Very dangerous. That's "Put it too, down." Yeah. And I'm like, "Well, I have to see my directions." And I'm an adult. I mean, I think I'm over 21, but I'm not behaving like I am. So yeah, it's it's a common problem. I mean, um, and and that's the thing is, we're all guilty of of you know some sort of distracted drive distracted driving behavior and distraction when driving can take, you know, it, it's a big spectrum, you know, for anything from, you know, flipping around the radio station can take your eyes off the road for a while. And that's, you know, goes way back to, 
you know, when radios were first put in cars. Um, but you know what? Can it's I, gotten can, a lot worse. Can yeah. I speak to that? You know, some of these cars now have one of our cars. We have an Audi, right? And you have to put your hand down and sort of adjust the dial. You know, the little like, do you mm-hmm. know what I'm talking about? Like the little round thing, and right. you have to. I find that so distracting. Instead of just looking up and pushing the button, I have to now look down and and maneuver something. I actually find even the way that they're making these cars to be way, way more complicated. Right. Technology. But, but don't you think so? Yeah, the yeah, technology yeah. can be just be too much. You've got the touch yeah. screen. What are you supposed to do if you've got a touch screen and you're trying to find something and, and you're you driving? touch it. And you cannot touch it. Exactly right. Yeah. And you might say, why don't you have a voice activated? Right. But if it's voice activated, then if you're talking to somebody about something else, it's going to set it off. Like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Like, what it, do you yeah, do? Yeah, the, the technology, proliferation of technology, both in and out of vehicles, is, um, you know, a big, a big issue. And I think auto manufacturers are trying to, to figure out, you know, that the best ways around it. Until, but the, the, the truth of the matter is, until we get to fully autonomous vehicles, you know, there's going to be challenges and people are going to be distracted. And, and what do we do until we get there? And I think the AT&T It Can Wait campaign is a good, you know, really strong step in the right direction just to try to, to really, what, what it comes down to is to change the culture of Okay, but of how driving. do you do that? How do you do that? Like, yeah. even for someone like me, who's, a, who's an adult, who's mm-hmm. running around looking down at her texts, I mean, should it be something that the minute you get in the car, it, I don't know, somehow shuts off? But then what do you do if you've got the Waze app and you need to look down at your right. Waze app? People always say to me, yeah. Deborah, you won't get lost if you use the Waze app. Mm. But then I have to use yeah. my phone to use the Waze app. I, I don't see that as a better solution. So what is the yeah. solution? Well, I think, you know, one of the, the, the strong solutions that we propose that our members um, implement are programs that support uh, strong law enforcement and strong education, um, a combination of the two. Um, we've seen actually good results in states that have um, handheld and texting texting while driving bans, um, particularly those, those with handheld bans, though. The, the challenge with texting alone is it's very difficult for law enforcement to determine whether somebody's just texting or whether they're doing something that's legal with their phone. So you really need to have, you know, strong, clear, consistent um, policies and laws in place and then, um, you know, implement the law enforcement because what we really have found, what changes behavior with um, when it comes to um, driving is laws plus enforcement. And we've seen that with drunk driving and we've seen that with um, seatbelts. Um, I, recently, drunk- I recently got a ticket. I got pulled over because I was looking down at my phone and holding my phone and I thought, oh, man. And uh, I was actually reading a text about my directions on where to go. And I told that to the officer. And um, I said, what's the difference if I was looking down to look for my directions or looking down to look at the Waze app? He really didn't care. Mm -hmm. The point was, you're not supposed to be looking down. I I actually don't see an answer to this because you're right. It's like the old school way of driving, you know, um, has to meet modern technology and how we use it. Like I said, if I'm guilty... Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot more people out there that are guilty, right? Yeah, yeah. But you raise a real good point with your kids. Um, we've actually, Connecticut had a real innovative campaign where they um, used the nagging power of children to try to help uh, get parents to put the phones down. Um, and, and it's very unique and innovative um, with a cartoon character called Ruff Ruffman um, partnering with WGBH in, in um, Boston. But they basically created like a whole campaign to try to, help kids sort of understand, hey, this is, you know, not okay. You should tell your parents to, you know, put put it down and try to kind of get that culture change started at the very ground levels because that's, you know, really where, where behavior comes from. It's, mo- it's uh, you know, something that we modeling in, in childhood. And then, yeah, and then it's modeled by the parents, but, but kids can influence their parents just as much as parents can influence their kids. Oh, and so in our case, there's no doubt about yeah. it. They're trying yeah. to influence me. <laughs> because yeah, so there's no doubt. So They're the parents. It's take and a very unique take. Yeah, you know what always helped? Do you remember, I don't know, you know, because you grew up in Italy, so I don't mm-hmm. even know uh, if they had this where you grew up. It's certainly where I grew up. You know, for drunk drivers, they would bring the cars to school that were involved in deadly oh, wow. accidents. And then the kids would be jolted into saying, seeing, oh, my goodness. So they're doing that with people who were in deadly accidents, sadly, uh, if they were texting or using, you know, the phones for something. You know, we have seen some of that. Um, quite honestly, the effectiveness of some of those campaigns alone are questionable. Um, really? Gosh, it, yeah. it, it made an impression on me. It, it certainly makes an impression, but the challenge is do you actually change the behavior? 
um, you know, it, it makes an impression, but it's not a, it's not necessarily a lasting impression. Hmm. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, we shouldn't continue the the cause. Like I said, I think it's a combination of, of the, the laws and the enforcement and the education and, you know, and like you said, there are some techno- technical technological solutions, rather. There are apps out there for you know, parents to monitor their teens. There are apps. Yeah, and guess what? For, and the teens can turn them off because my <laughs> teen will turn it off, which pisses mm. me off. I mean, they are way ahead of where we are. Right. So there's an app on there, and then you might say, oh, well, then tell the kid he won't get his phone. My kid would look at me and go, okay, take the phone. I mean, you know, the best thing to do is just the best you can not do it. I mean, it's really just a matter of yeah. not doing it or making the um, – you know, should you get pulled over, making the fines so astronomical, like they do in the carpool lanes, mm-hmm. you know, the worst thing is to maybe get right. stopped and pulled over because you're going to get like a $500 yeah. fine, fine yeah. or parking yeah. in the uh, handicap when you shouldn't. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. prohibitive, I think that's what really stops but, uh, a lot of people. I think the big, it, yeah, I'm ahead. sorry, I'm sorry, Kara, but I think the biggest issue is like, uh, like you said, the selfies because see, like for the uh, I can't na- believe that. Yeah, yeah, the navigation system and text messaging, like we, you know, you can uh, you can use your headset. You know, you can speak to the phone, it can text for you, or you can listen to the navigation system like through your headset and follow the directions without looking at the phone. But how do you take selfies? Why do you, you need know? a selfie like of yourself self- driving somewhere? Exactly. I how don't. I don't, I don't do that? it. No, but, not you. But, uh, <laughs> but the biggest problem is like how do you uh, fix this problem? You know, because the teens, like the, the younger generation, they want to take pictures while they're driving. Right. So like, look at me. I'm that? on my yeah. way to this place. Exactly. exactly. And crush, you know. That's true. But, so, uh, um... I don't know. What's your answer? I mean, sadly, you don't want something horrible to happen to sort of teach somebody a lesson, but I guess you just drill it in there. I don't know. School? What? Yeah, I think I think parents are key. Schools are key. Um, it, it's a very, very... Behavior is, is probably, you know, human behavior is, is a, a very... If, anyone had, if anyone's figured out how to change, how to, you know, the success, how to change it, they would be, a, you know, billionaire by now. But right. it's something that we all struggle with and, and looking at... The different tools and and what we can do is go with what we know has has worked in the past. We have reduced, um, we have dramatically increased um, the rate of seatbelts, for example. Um, I can't it, imagine I, getting behind the wheel without a seatbelt on. Can yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, no, people just I, do I, it by I, habit now, and, and some people don't um, don't feel the the urge to. Okay, put that's it on, that's just nuts. I mean, you're just going right yeah. through the windshield, if even at even at a, a slow impact, so, yeah, right? Slow impact, well, yeah. some people think that the the seatbelt will cut into them during an accident, though. They, they think that I'd rather be cut into yeah, exactly, thrown out. Right? So, yeah. but anyway, yeah. um, I appreciate your being on with us today. I really do. So, I mean, I guess the key is just get the word out there. Don't do it because you can kill yourself and right. kill somebody else yeah. too over a stupid picture that you're on your yeah. way somewhere. Right. I right. Think, By the way, yeah, I honestly think the more that we can just as a as a society don't not be afraid to say, hey, that's not okay when we see somebody else doing it. If we're a passenger in the car, speak up. Um, and if you're a driver in the car, just you know, resist that urge. It's such a tremendous urge. And I mean, I felt it myself. I've had to put the car, the phone in the back seat out of really? reach, you know, because I'm like, no, that's just, but it's like this, it's like this innate sort of, you know, very prim- primitive urge to like, well, who's that texting me? What, what's going on? You know, to want to be in constant contact all the time. I mean, it really is a, a primordial driven. There's, there's tests that, that show this and there's research that show this is, it's that tap on the shoulder that, you know, evolutionarily we want to know what's going on and we want to stay in touch all the time. Um, so and, it's and very difficult to, to resist. <laughs> and without a doubt, it's got to be worse than the drunk driving because not everyone is dr- drinking and driving all day and night. Right, that's but true. everyone's got their phone. And whether that's they're true. taking a picture or they're looking for directions, I mean, it's, it's like a lethal weapon sitting in there. So you make a good yeah. point, though. If you're a passenger in the car... Just say something and say, hey, man, that, that's just, like, not cool. Do not do it. Like my kids do. They'll yell at me and say, you're going to kill us. Who right. wants a kid saying that? So I immediately put it down. I love how, how Riley's laughing because that's how they talk to me. They're like, you're going to kill us. So, of course, I'm going to put it down. <laughs> so, in other words, be aware and, um, and get the word out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right. Yeah. I really appreciate your coming on. Thank you so, so, so much. Oh, you're absolutely welcome. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy for the opportunity. Yeah. Thanks a lot. We'll talk okay. to you next okay, time. Okay, no problem. Okay, mm-hmm. bye. Bye-bye. It's interesting. I mean, you do not you you do not take pictures when you're driving. No, I'm hopeful. No, no, no. What a dumb thing. I won't say dumb. All right, people find it fun to do. They just don't realize that they could be hurting themselves or somebody else. I get into my a lot of trouble myself. Um, 
just looking down at my text for directions. And right, I've got to figure yeah. I've got to figure something else out. And very often I will print well, yeah, like really, really. Remember, like you know, when we didn't have all this uh, technology, you know, like in the old uh, in the old days, um, you know, you would learn the way to go from point A to point B, and then you would follow like the directions that you have in your mind. And now. You know, I do the same thing. If I have to go, for example, today I had to go, I, I have to come here. So I kind of like look through the map a little bit. And because I know I don't want to like constantly look down on my phone. And uh, and also I want to be fast. I don't want to wait for the GPS to tell me turn left, turn right, turn left. That thing so, makes me nuts because right, it exactly. also doesn't tell me soon enough. And I'm exactly. like, Exactly. Sometimes hey, you miss your exit. You know? Yeah, so they tell you, you learn, just as you're coming up Ahead on of it. time you study your your um, your trip, uh, your your roads and everything. And then, uh, and then with the headset, it's very simple. You just listen to it, and then oh okay, you know I saw it, and you know, and I do it. But uh, but also the other thing is like texting. Like nowadays, nobody nobody talks anymore. I mean, it's like that's another thing. You know, you're always like texting, texting. There is no more com real communication. Emails let, and texts. Like, let me tell don't you, talk. I have a friend or two, and we will text, and our texts get very lost in translation. Like, right. um, when are you going to be there? I don't know. And then the other person might take it as. They don't know. They don't want me there, you know. <laughs> and then you write back and say, "Well, give me an idea." And I, I always eventually say, "Stop the texting. Pick up the phone and call right, exactly. me." Exactly. Yeah. But then they don't want to, and I'm thinking, "This is not going to go well." I have that issue a lot. I'd rather just pick up the phone. Right. You and know, call, and talk, thirty yeah. to thirty seconds to a minute phone conversation. You've got the details down. You know and, what I mean? And also because we hide uh, behind these texts nowadays. You know, we say things that we want to say in person. And uh, but we don't have the courage, maybe, and um, I don't know. Like, I technology is good, but some, sometimes it's bad as well. You know, like I agree with you. I think we hide behind a lot of stuff, right. and it's so much easier to tell somebody whatever it is you want to say in a couple of sentences. You don't have to deal with it. You put it aside, and you're done. And there's no interpersonal stuff. I don't know how to get around that either. Right. I'm also a big texter, but I believe if there's something you have to say to somebody, you know, you're trying to meet them or whatever. Pick up the phone. Text so. is good, you know, like when you're in a hurry, you know, you text, like, but when, when we need to talk, we need to talk. That's why it's called talking. It's not like texting, you know, it's not writing. <laughs> you know, me and Riley, when we talk, sometimes we talk. I mean, you know, we talk for like hours and it's good to talk. You do? I know he's great like that. He's, yeah. he's really good. He's a good listener. Right. He's yeah. a really good listener. We have another guest, but I thought they were coming on a little later. Are they on now? Is she on right now? Whitney? Yes, I'm here. Okay, this is great. Do you mind if we go to our guests and then um, we'll, the, you've got the rest of the show all yeah. to yourself. Do you want to do that? Perfect. Okay, so I love having your comments. <laughs> I mean, if you don't mind, is that all right with you? Yeah, it's good. Okay, Whitney, how are you? Can Would you, please, your last name for us. Would you say it for me? Thor. Okay, thank it's you. Thor. Mm -hmm. Thor, she, you are just beautiful. And thank you for coming on with us. You've got a very, very interesting, you had a YouTube video, Fat Girl Dancing, that sort of went viral. And from there... You become sort of a body positive activist. Is that what you call yourself? Yes. Okay. Um, and tell me if you don't mind. You know how that whole thing started. And you also currently have a pretty successful show on uh, the Learning Channel. Is that correct? My big fat fabulous life. Yep. Um, and uh, my book just came out uh, a couple weeks ago. It's called I Do It with the Lights On. Say it again. You what? I do it with the lights on. I love that. Look at you. Look at the cover of her book. You wow. look like an angel. You look. You're beautiful. I love Thank that. You. So tell us a little bit about um, what inspired you to do this. I mean, did it all start with this dancing video? You know, it kind of feels like it did. But when I really look back at it, um, this has been in the making, you know, really forever. I uh, grew up. I was thin. I was a dancer, an athlete. And I still never felt like I was thin enough. I struggled with eating disorders. Um, and it was really difficult, and unfortunately, it's not uncommon. You know, if you're not a sick, we're often told as women that we're too big. So um, when I got to college, I started uh, gaining weight really inexplicably. I ended up gaining 50 pounds in the first three months and then almost Oof. 100 pounds in the first year well, of college. Well, that'll do it to you, that dorm food or whatever, that, you know, <laughs> well, food that you get you know, at and school. That's what, well, that's what people would say. They're like, oh, well, you're drinking and, you know, you're young and whatever. And so I really just internalized it and I'd always felt fat anyway so I thought okay well I guess I'm just really fat now um in 2005 I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome and um a lot of all these other symptoms that I'd had but didn't know what they meant you kind of fell into place and um PCOS is really common it affects one in 10 women in America it's the leading cause of infertility 
And it's unfortunate that there's still very little uh, public awareness about it. Um, and by that time, I was like 280 pounds. You know, I know so, a little um, bit about that. That it correlates a little bit to overeating. There's really something, you know, chemical going on in the body where it sort of sort of makes you want to eat. Isn't that correct? I do know a little bit. I know someone else who's had that. And she had a really, really she had a huge struggle um, trying to take weight off because she found herself eating uh, more than she should have. Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. When I first gained the, the first 100 pounds, my eating habits didn't change at all. Um, oh. You know, wow. of course, I was drinking. I was in college, and you know, I mean, they changed a little bit. I could have seen myself maybe gaining, I don't know, maybe twenty, thirty pounds or something. But to gain a hundred, um, just didn't make any sense. And of course, I was on a meal plan. I didn't. Even, my dad always pointed. I was like, I didn't even have money to eat as much as it would have taken me to gain that much weight. Um, there was a lot of factors with PCOS. It's uh, a hormonal disorder. Um, my testosterone is twice the level of normal. I'm insulin resistant, which that's the cause of. Um, a lot of the weight gain and the difficulty with losing weight, it is possible. Um, in 2011, I actually lost 100 pounds in eight months. But um, I was basically starving. I was working out 15 hours a week. I didn't have a job. And a lot of my eating disorder behavior came back. So like most people do, I put all the weight back on. And I was really at the lowest point in my life. I was 29 years old working at a radio station in North Carolina. And felt like, you know, I just had no idea where to go from there. And that's when I decided... Um, I was going to make these videos and I hadn't danced in so long. I'm talking like probably a decade uh, because I was so embarrassed and I was so ashamed of my body. And um, I decided to make these dance videos and lo and behold, uh, one of them went viral and then here I am. So it's, it's really been a whirlwind. It's been about two years now since that video and uh, life has definitely changed a lot. How many hits did you get on that when you were your dancing videos? Your, so Well, it was... Do it we, was viral have... on Facebook first, and this is before you could count video views, so I have no idea. But on YouTube, it has uh, over 8 million. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. So that's what you have to do to get 8 million hits on YouTube. <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out. So I just, should I just dance? You know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a pretty good dancer. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't. People try every day. I really am. We certainly never anticipated. I mean, my dance partner, Todd, and I, we've been dancing together since we were kids. And we said, Lord, if we had known this would go viral, we would have done a, a much better job. Um, I keep, you know, I keep thinking I'm going to stumble. You know, I keep thinking I'm going to stumble onto something, you know, to get those 8 million hits. And for you, it was, I guess you were a little chubby and you started dancing. And what, it goes viral? What happens? Somebody calls the next guy and goes, you got to see this girl dancing. Is that how that goes? How something becomes viral like that? I mean, it's... Well, yeah, I, I think, I mean, we knew what we were doing a little bit. We just thought it would be only for, like, our radio listeners. But we knew that, um, you know, a title like A Fat Girl Dancing would get people's attention. We knew people would want to watch because people love to watch fat people make fools of themselves and make fun of fat people. Um, but then the other element that I think made it really go viral was that I'm actually a good dancer, and it's not something that people expect. And so I did, I mean, I did a press tour. I did Good Morning America, Today Show, Steve Harvey. Dr. God, Oz, all even. because you were you know? a chubby lady dancing. That's incredible. So all this has now turned you into, if you will, um, an activist, someone who speaks out for people who are overweight, who deal with body image issues, who really feel so, so awful about themselves. And by the way, it's not just heavy people. I think all kinds of people feel awful, especially women, about themselves for any given reason. Um, and I think it's great that you're out there um, really trying to get people to feel better about themselves. And I love the show, My Big Fat okay. Fabulous Life. I love the name of that. I love that. I do, too. And I really think that it's important that we start to um, uh, destigmatize the word fat. Um, it's often used as an insult. It's thought to be, you know, the worst thing that a person can be called. And for me, what I want people to know is that fat people are normal people. Um, fat people can be athletes. Fat people can be beautiful. Fat people can be funny. Fat people can be smart. Um, and that's what I hope that I'm accomplishing uh, because I realized, and I, I never thought it, but I mean, after, you know, hating my body for my whole life, being thin, being fat, losing 100 pounds, nothing ever changed. Nothing ever changed until I decided I love myself and my body unconditionally, and I'm going to do what I love, and I don't need anyone's permission to do it. Um, that was the thing that changed my life, I and uh, that's what I want other people to know. I have to tell you, I got really heavy after my third kid, and I sort of felt invisible. And then I got sick of it, so I lost the weight. And sometimes I'll go up and I'll go down. But people looked at me very, very differently after I lost the weight again. And I'd never been heavy before. I just got that way because mm -hmm. I, I couldn't, you know, I had to lay there for eight months. So I just got that way. And it was amazing for years how people looked at me very, very, very differently. 
then when I lost the weight, it was it was very different. So people do, I mean, they'll look at a person and they will judge based on what they find to be attractive in their eyes, you know. And I right. think it's great to destigmatize it, but you also can't take away from somebody if they think someone looks heavy and it's not appealing to them. I mean, I hate to say well, that. Well, yeah, I think you're 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 hitting on a good point um, that is so often misunderstood. Um, fat activism is not about being attractive at all. Hmm. Uh, I think okay. people are allowed their their preferences. I'm not asking to be found beautiful. And in fact, what I'm asking is to be a woman who doesn't have to be beautiful to be accepted. And I think that's the, that is the largest deeply uh, rooted issue is that with women, if people aren't attracted to us, then we're not good enough. Then we don't, we're not a full person. Well, you, we you hit on it. Way. You hit on it there because I know, um, you definitely hit upon something there because I um, I will very often feel that way. You know, I'll just say, oh, my gosh, I feel so much better because I lost this weight. I don't know, maybe because physically I felt better about it or right. the way people perceive me. So I like the fact that you want to get out there and say to people, please don't judge me this way. Just judge me for who I am. You don't even have to find me attractive. You can, but just judge me for in here. And that's what's important. And I mean, I'm hearing yeah, you absolutely. and I'm looking at it a different way, too. It just and what you said is so true for me. I found that when I gained weight, suddenly, even though I'd always dealt with people kind of calling me fat because I was like 130 pounds, but um, when I actually got fat, it was like a social experiment where you put on a fat suit and go out in public. Mm -hmm. um, and it was then that I realized, oh my gosh, my whole life, so much of my value has been in the fact that I was a conventionally attractive person and now I'm not and so people think that I'm worthless and that's what we want to change um, and we're a lot more lenient with men you know we don't totally discount a man based on the way he looks so for women I want us to know um, I'm not fighting for the right to, to be beautiful I'm just fighting for the right to not have to be basically and still be seen as a valuable human being and and um, I know that now you know now I'm the happiest I've ever been but I'm also the happiest I've ever been the most confident I've ever been and that's possible to do even when you feel like you don't look the way that you should. Well, that's pretty amazing. There's a shot of you up there. You've got like a purple T-shirt on, right? Is that how you're looking now? Because I think you look terrific. I'm not. Well, I'm not sure which photo that you're looking at, actually. Um, it says no. You're, you've got a T-shirt on and it says no BS. It's like a purple T-shirt, yeah. right? I think you look gorgeous yeah, that's there. How I, yeah, well, thank you. I think you look really um, yeah, sexy, yeah, actually. It's a sexy gorgeous. shot, don't you think? <laughs> I yeah. think so. You know, I think you look really sexy. I do, and it's amazing how many people will say to me, I, you know, I've never found a big girl attractive, but I think you are. And I would say, you know what, that's because you're not just looking at my body. You're seeing that I'm confident. You're seeing that I'm happy. Um, and that's really, you know, beauty, conventional beauty will fade. Everybody will be old and wrinkly and saggy and everything else. And so I think it is important that, of course, we want to be attracted to the people that we're with. But we do think, I think, need to put more emphasis on other qualities, um, especially for women, because we're full human beings capable of whatever we want to do, regardless of how we look. How can people get in touch with you to f to get your book, the name of the book, and how can they get it? And also your show. When can people see your show? Right. Well, the show's My Big Fat Fabulous Life. We're coming in the third episode of the third season tonight um, oh. at 9, 8 Central on TLC. That's huge. And That's book, really huge, right? That's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's going really well. Um, the book is called I Do It With The Lights On and 10 More Discoveries on the Road to a Blissfully Shame-Free Life. You can find that um, in bookstores online. It's also on Audible. You can get it for Nook or Kindle. And um, my website is nobodyshame.com. You can tweet at me at Whitney Way. You can find me on Instagram, Whitney Way Thor, and on Facebook at Whitney Thor. What do you do with the lights on, Whitney? Um, a lot of things, you know. Because <laughs> I like the name of that book. It's a metaphor, but yeah, it's also, yeah, uh, I keep the lights on in my bedroom, and that felt really, really liberating for me once I was able to do that. Yep. Mm -hmm. I get it. All right. Thank you so much for being on. I really enjoyed talking to you. And everybody, let's check out the show tonight. That's terrific. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. She's lovely. I yeah. mean, I know what it feels like. I wasn't quite um, like that, but she looks at it all very differently. She right. just wants people to look at her for who she is as opposed to um, what she looks, what we look like. Yeah. And that's difficult. You know, yeah. we've really come such a long way, don't you think, yeah. in life, yeah. in terms of how we perceive so much in life, um, black that's people, yeah. gay people. I mean, we've really, really come a long way. And I agree. I mean, it's time to hopefully change how we look at people who don't look the acceptable way according to the magazines. Right. Like 
who look like you, for example. <laughs> Such a handsome man from Thank Italy. You. I was so excited to find out that you were from Italy because I told you on the phone I am mm -hmm. full-blooded Italian. Yeah, that's um, great. Now, where are you from in Italy? Rome. You're from Rome. Rome. And yeah. you came here when you were in your 20s. I was. I came here, yeah, when I was uh, 22 and a half, actually, yeah. The half really matters because if you matters. came at 22... All bets were off. Yeah. So tell me why you came out here and what you what you were doing. I um, was, uh, you know, I came here like um, I le I just left the police force. I was a cop, a policeman for oh my policia. God. An Italian cop. police officer, yeah. not a stripper, eh? Not like the one dressed like. Let a me cop tell you, a police you know, officer, the real one. <laughs> I mean, because they're strong and they take control. But to be an Italian police officer in Rome got me there. Okay, right. so go ahead. So I, le I left the police force. <laughs> I moved here, and. Um, I, I joined the police force when I was 18, so I stayed there for like, uh, you know, quite some time. So I, I moved here just to become a writer, and then I ended up like becoming an actor. And uh, that's very brave, though, yeah. you know, to just sort of it's one thing to move from, you know, Kansas right. over to LA or New York. Did you come straight to LA? Yes. Okay. Yes. But to, actually, to I had make... a friend here, so oh, okay. he was studying, he was studying English. Uh, and uh, so I moved here just, just, just for vacation at the beginning, and then I ended up staying. Okay. And then what did you do when you first got here? I did many jobs. Yeah, like I everybody who comes like here, right? Everybody, many jobs. But uh, fortunately, like, um, I was a waiter, I was a busboy, I was a mover. Um, then I became uh, also an Italian teacher uh, over the Berlitz School uh, oh. in Beverly Hills. And, uh, but fortunately, I booked, like, uh, you know, quite a few jobs uh, in between. And then Days of Our Lives, my first soap, came came pretty fast, actually, nine, at the end of 95. And what did you do on Days? I mean, people would know you from Days of Our Lives. I played and also, uh, a character, like a mysterious character called Franco Kelly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so well, it was like in the mysterious. very mysterious because uh, nobody knew, not even me, what I was doing on this. <laughs> well, they Roblox. never tell you anything until you get the script anyway, <laughs> right, right? Exactly. It's like you not get even the, the writers. I no, think, you know, they're, I, still, they're, they're still trying to figure it out. You get the script and you're like, <laughs> what? Where, where, where is he coming from? <laughs> or, we don't know, but he's got the accent. He's beautiful. <laughs> right? Or, or you get the script and you're not in right. it. And you're like, wait a minute, that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> so, okay, so you get the script. You're this mysterious yeah, Italian Mysterious man. Italian. I mean, come on. You get a lot of the Don Juan kind of a thing right right, right? Uh, and it was funny because you're not funny. really an nice... italian mobster type you're more of like the italian no i never I, ne I never played one i always played one but you know like i i think the mobster the mobster italian guys they're always like uh they look meaner. Fed, ugly and from new york i guess yeah they're so like, like they're like, they're not I... exactly they're the italians out of new york right Right. right, exactly. There's no doubt about hey, it. Forget the about it. Hey. So yeah. <laughs> okay, explain to me something. And again, I'm full-blooded Italian. How come the people come over from Italy are very refined and lovely, and then they get to New York and New Jersey and they end up like this? I don't get I what don't, happens when yeah, they're crossing I, over the ocean. I don't know. It must be the water. I don't know. Or maybe the food. I don't know. <laughs> because <laughs> let me tell you, I have a lot of those relatives right. who are kind of like this, you know, and I think... What you talking about, eh? And I grew up with a lot. I grew up with a lot. Manja, manja. I, I grew right. up with an awful lot of that. Right. And I mean, hundreds of relatives would just come out of nowhere. And I, I often wondered, who are those people? You know, because there's just cousins upon cousins right. and then cousin of that cousin. It's like, what do you mean? You don't know Vito? Yeah, yeah, and I'd see, say, um, <laughs> no, I don't. And I'm the only one who made my way out here, which is interesting. I very often feel alone out here. So you're from the East Coast, basically. Yes, New Jersey. Like, oh, yeah. And my family came from, um, oh my gosh, right outside of Naples in uh, Avellino. Avellino. Oh, yeah. Avellino. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, so right outside of Naples is where most of my family's from. Right. Some are from the northern section, um, but most of them are from down south. Oh, wow. And like I said, they cr as soon as they cross over and land on this soil, mm -hmm. They, they become kind of like they that. Hair, like they hair, like they grew a hairy Yeah, and they got the and chains and the, and the chains, the, you know. So, um, but that's not you, that's and that's and that's not me either. So, but I'm changing. Look, 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 look <laughs> at the you rings. You got a lot I of. The <laughs> I, I didn't have these rings in Italy. Where's, where's, see, where's, see, where's your gold true. chain? I don't have a gold chain, but you know, it's uh, it's true. It's the, it must be the air or something. I don't know. Oh, I don't have much of a temper, so you know. I they do. Say, I do. But I don't. You know, I don't think so unless I'm really mad. But. I mean, it's in the genetic code, so right. I guess I would have it's to the if DNA, I'm really. Yeah. I'm, I'm animated, but I don't think I'm really angry. But okay, so you did um, <laughs> the soap, and then you did uh, primetime Southland. I did Southland. A lot of people would know you I for did Southland. CSI. I did. Uh, what you did know, you do on Bones. CSI? Uh, you know, guest starring roles. You're there. like uh, last year. I just finished Bones. You know, like uh, love that. Yeah. 
And, uh, you know, many, many, I have Frasier, you know, because I love to do comedy and, uh, you know, many, many guests. So you're roles, really, yeah. really versatile. Yes, yes. And now this film, now it just came out in New York or it's it's going to be released this weekend out um, in New York, do you know? It just, uh, it just opened in New York and Times Square, there's the Regal, uh, Times Square. And, love uh, the Regal. Again, yeah. I, I know all this because I lived in right, New York before right. I came out here and it's and, called uh, The Homeless Billionaire. It's called The Homeless Billionaire. Uh, co-starring uh, Ioni Sky, Dali Shire, uh, Ron Silver, uh, bless his soul, because he passed away. Um, so sad. Yeah, very sad. Well, he passed away, I think, in 2008 or nine, you know, yeah. right after the movie. Yeah. Yeah. A very great actor. Uh, Michael Boatman. We have great cast, great cast. And uh, it's a romantic comedy. Uh, it's really beautiful, beautiful movie. Yeah. What do you play? I play Ferro Olivetti, this uh, Italian guy, duh, with the accent. You know what else <laughs> and can play? Wait, Abraham what? Lincoln. What? what Your Ferro? Uh, what are you? Ferro <laughs> Olivetti is like this uh, Italian billionaire. You know, it's got to be fun. It's, it's, it's a stretch. It's a stretch because yeah, I'm a homeless, <laughs> so you know, like playing a billionaire was a stretch. Mm -hmm. And um, that basically, he, uh, you know, upon his father's will, he has to like uh, get away from his wealth. And and move to New York for thirty days and without do what? with in struggle without in struggle, his billions so without anything basically and become homeless and at the beginning at the beginning he's like well I, you know why why but then at the end of the third thirtieth day he understands why because in order to find the true love that's why it's a romantic comedy. Romance. So he I mean, you he know, hooks like up he, with another homeless person. Is that he what hooks happens? Up or? With a homeless girl. No, I'm just. Uh, I mean, which would be very romantic and lovely. <laughs> nothing against. Nothing that, against. That would be an interesting plot. Actually. Well, why not? I, like I mean, that. you should have me write this stuff. Right. But I mean, so. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. So he, he finds true love. It's kind of like a Cinderella movie. You know, he finds true love and uh, he ends up, you know, marrying the girl and live um, happy ever yeah. after. So how long did it take you to shoot this? Was it any? We we shot it in New York like uh, what, five weeks, I think. Yeah. You know, it was five weeks. Uh, Have you ever lived in New York? No, I visit many times. I, I like New York, uh, but you know it gets really hot in the summer because I remember while shooting, um, by the end of June it was like unbearable, like the heat. Well, the it's street. humid. Like That's humid what it is. It's really really humid. That's like, why everyone takes off for either the right. Hamptons or the Jersey right. Shore. You know, right. for me it was always the Jersey oh, Shore. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and there were lots of the Italians down there right. too, you know, especially, you know, seaside and those places. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you like my accent, huh? Right. I like that. Yeah. I you like, like it. it. Yeah. I've, I've got a, I got to show you some pictures of my relatives. You will really, really have a good time with them. But New York, I could see you living there because it's a very sophisticated city. It's a lot of yeah. fun. But you probably went there at the wrong time of year because yeah, probably yeah. summer and probably during a heat wave, which yeah. is even worse. Yes, yes, it was um, brutal. It was brutal. And then what? What it really surprised me about New York and Manhattan, especially like the rats. Like well, in the middle of the summertime, it's I mean, it's like they come out. And <laughs> let me tell you, I counted forty-two rats on the movie set. And he's like, "This is Manhattan. It's like uh, you know, it's a wealthy, you know, America." It's well, you're like the billionaire, right? You're, I'm the billionaire. you're the it's homeless like, billionaire. Well, yeah. maybe oh, they weren't just props that they threw out surprised. there for your. I mean, I you know, I I I visit, I I travel a lot, and I never seen that many rats. Mm -hmm. And they weren't afraid of people, and they're not afraid of cats. I mean, they're like, I mean, it, it shocked a, me. It is a problem there. It really, really so is. So you've seen them too, right? Of course I have. Yeah. I mean, recently I was at, um, I mean, I'm a Mets fan. I have to say that because I'll get in trouble. But I was at a Mets game and then a Yankees game. I went to both. And when I was coming out of the Yankee Stadium and I was you know, taking the subway back into the city, they were down on the platform of the subway. And Cheering. I, the game. I may have been one of the only people Oof. screaming and trying to go up the stairs, looking at my friends saying, but, but, and they're like, oh, yeah. calm down. And I'm like, what do you mean calm down? It, yeah. there's, there's rats on the, on the platform. They come out in the summer. They just yeah. do. They get pissed off. They're hungry. They're hot. Right. <laughs> and they have no desire to go hiding, you know, in tunnels and, or anything else. Or they, so they in Italy, out. we have classiest rats. I mean, with the jacket and the cool shades. <laughs> like, you know, and they move to America and they become like this, hey, hey. <laughs> we need food now. You need to go there more in the springtime or in right. the fall springtime, because New York is really beautiful. an incredible. Yeah. I've been place. there in September actually. And yeah, it, it could be hot then too, but yeah, it was, probably got to. Was, was was cool. Actually. You know, the best yeah. time to go to New York is for the Thanksgiving Day Parade. It's so nice. Mm. They're blowing up all the floats, you know, all along Central Park, and it's just a really fun place to be. And New Yorkers sort of just 
I like, like New York, though. Yeah. I like New York. It, it's really close to home, too, because it's like within like seven hours, you're, you're back home in Rome, direct flight. And I like that. Yeah, no, exactly. And you're yeah. close to coming here. You're close yeah. to going over there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, absolutely. So now, you, of course, you've been living out here for quite some time. Yeah. And Long are time, you doing yeah. a press tour for this? I mean, how is this going to go? Not really. You know, like, uh, we just uh, released it, and, uh, you know, they did a little press in New York because, you know, it's kind of, like, local. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, like, nationwide. So, you know, I did the little press. Well, it's in, limited release now, yeah, but depending upon release, how well exactly. it does, right? I if mean, it does well in New York, uh, hopefully it's going to be, you know, nationwide, distributed nationwide. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so what are you working on next? What are you doing for the summer out here in well, L.A.? Are you traveling right, somewhere? Or? No, right now I just got back. I was in Rome. Uh, unfortunately, my grandmother passed away uh, two weeks ago. A week ago, I'm sorry, a week ago, yeah. But I was in Rome. I was there for like eight days, and then I was in New York for a week. And um, putting together a movie that I wrote is called The Roman Diary with uh, uh, a producer and friend of mine from Canada. Mm -hmm. He optioned the screenplay, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see. Mm-hmm. What do you like it's to do in your what is what is the Italian guy like to do in his spare time out here in Los Angeles? What do you spare, do for fun? Spare, spare time uh, for fun, I, I like to do sports. You know, like I'm a, I'm like what? A, you know, what do you like to I, do? I like boxing. You know, I've oh been, really? Yeah, I've been doing boxing since I was like 12 years old. Mm -hmm. That's a big and thing in Italy too. Yeah, a lot yeah, of my I uncles so, used yeah. to be boxers. So my uncles too, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's kind yeah. of a big thing. That and bocce yeah. ball, right? Yeah. <laughs> you ever play? Bo oh, bocce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the summer, you know, in the su during the summer, all the time. Yeah. So you box? Do you yeah. live sort of kind of close to the beach? Like, do you yeah, do any like, surfing or no, no surfing? I tried many years ago. It didn't go well. So no. you know, I'm <laughs> Italian. Yeah. What else do you do? Motorcycles. I have this. Habit to collect. It's kind of sexy, uh, right? Like this. And drive motorcycles. I love motorcycles. Yeah. And know. where do you go? Do you just go up the I coast? Go, I, or? I, you know, the, the, the funny thing, growing up in Italy, we don't uh, ride motorcycles to go like on trips or to plan like a big trip. Like we use it like as a, an everyday way of, um, of getting around yeah so like to me it's, it's like it's so would, different there it's, it's different so like i would get up on you know my motorcycle i mean and and go to the grocery store you know like that's uh i don't plan it and while i have uh people from here from america that call me up and say like, hey dude let's sunday let's take the motorcycle and go up the it's like why <laughs> it's like, it is a very like i drive it every day why do i have to do that it you is know? a like sunday very I'm resting. you are so right but so different you know, out here different. even then from where i come from back east it's just different we we call them in italy we call them the sunday riders you know like and uh, the sunday drivers yeah or, or, yeah, yeah, yeah well riders because they ride bikes but yeah drivers yeah so it's the same thing so i think if you if you love a motorcycle you use you use it all the time you don't need to like use it like on a sunday or saturday just to show off hey i ride a motorcycle i'm cool you know i ride it every day i ride it to the gym did you ride it here no I you did didn't. Not. No, well, no, you no, want to mess up your hair. Exactly. That you can't mess you. up your hair. Yeah. <laughs> but I love getting on the back of a motorcycle. I cannot drive one, that's for right. sure. But they are so much fun. Yeah. I've had a you know, friend took me out on his not too long ago, and he was just going up the mountain roads, and he, I was scared to right. death. And he did that one on purpose. Yeah. But that's not um, cool. no, that is not cool. He was. I think he was trying to be cool, and then he was trying to. Scared See, shit and, out of and, me. and and also because on a motorcycle there is no texting, no looking down on your phone. There is nothing. Oh, could you imagine? You, you are die. flying off that. You are so right. Could you imagine one hand you just, you're driving uh, and then you're you like just this? Just avoid the problem, you know. <laughs> like that's it, you know. Like sometimes I hear my phone ringing, or you know, I, I you there's know. There's no I'm way you're gonna look down. No, there for is that. no way you can't. So you just have to pull over and say politely, say, "Hey, I'm riding my motorcycle," uh, you know. Uh, or, frankly, mm -hmm. it would go flying out of your hand, and there goes your phone. You're done. Yeah, that's it. You're done. So you they really have helmets have... now uh, that it'll display it on the visor. Oh, wow. What will it display? Wow. Your text messages. Wow. It'll See, I didn't know that. on your helmet. See, I don't, I don't There's a Christmas the... gift for you well, if you want you. it. But how thank stupid but is I... that? I mean, they're going to think of anything. Yeah. Yeah. And it also has rear view camera, so you can see behind you. Wow. And well, that's good, yeah. right? You want to be able to see behind you, well, then but you don't want to be able to really see expensive. behind you while you're looking at your text, looking down, looking ahead at you. I mean, that's just nuts. Technology. I didn't know that, but I, I like to enjoy my motorcycle. I'll bet. You so know, and right Europeans on. just do it a whole different right. way. Is, is all your family still out there? Yeah, everybody. everybody don't you miss yeah, them? Yeah. Don't you ever just sort I of do, want to I take do. it back? I, 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 I do, actually. Like, uh, when I was there like a, a week ago, I just realized that I, I missed... 23 years of my grandmother's life. You know, I grew up with her. I, I live with her, like, uh, in her house. So I, I just realized that. It's like, wow, 
you know, we really fly through time, you know, like it's it's kind of like uh, it's amazing. So are, your, are your parents or I don't know if you have siblings or they? Uh, no, uh, no, no. I'm the only child and uh, my mom is still there. My aunt, uh, my cousins, they have kids. I don't have kids and uh, everybody's still there. No, I miss them. But are you involved yeah. with anyone? I'm involved. You're involved. I'm involved. I'm involved too, so I can't like yeah. ask much further. But so you're involved. We are involved. For people, <laughs> maybe not with the, each other. <laughs> though. I, I don't know. We make this like you know. Otherwise, your your husband or your fiance or your boyfriend. Oh, that's gonna, okay. He's used to me gonna, flirting with everyone, right. so don't even worry about it. <laughs> but so you're involved. So all the girls out there can't just come knocking. You're like no, no, they can knock. They, they can, can knock. knock. Okay, so you hear that? <laughs> you can still knock. Whether he'll answer the door or not, we're not sure. But you yeah, can still knocking knock. is like it's kind. It's kind of like looking. You know. You can always look. You can always knock. You don't know if he's gonna open that door. You know. Can you tell us a little more, or you just want to keep no, it all private? No, I, I keep it private. You yeah. keep it private. Always, always. Okay, so what do you guys like to do on the weekend? You get on your bikes, or I, I, I ride solo. You do. So it's your time to just sort it's of like disconnect, throw the phone it's my, yeah, out, and yeah, just no, like disconnect yeah. and do your own thing. Even to go to the grocery store, <laughs> I ride solo. What's your next work project? The the next well right now nothing I have nothing lined up actually so you know it's like the life of an actor. Do you, you hear that? That you, would that would give me such anxiety. You just can just sit around and just wonder because I would think, oh my gosh, am, am I going to work again? Or you just figure I, something will come up. I kind of like, I, yeah, no, I used to look at it that, that way, you know, right? And and I was always like, uh, you know, anxious and it's like, oh my gosh, and you know, and then the stuff happens, right? But nowadays, it's kind of like I ride along, you know. It's like, well, okay, more free time, you know. We'll see. I'm not, you know, because we don't get a lot of it. That's for sure, right? Right. I mean, just going back to Italy and being with family and watching it go by, you realize you don't get a lot of it anyway. Yeah, so exactly. that's a good way to look at it. So um, and plus, you... I like writing, so I write a lot. Uh, a lot. I I finished like uh, this year. I finished like three screenplays. They all suck. They, I'm just I'm, kidding. What are you trying to do with them? Are you trying well, to get I'm them made to into write, films? Yeah, or? exactly. Yeah. Okay. I would like to write a novel, actually, based on a movie that I wrote about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I would like to challenge myself because, you know, like I write in English and English is not my first language. So but we'll see now. I'm writing one and it's been going pretty well, actually. I'm writing one about my family, my parents, mm -hmm. who they recently passed, my dad. Mm -hmm actually Sorry passed away one year ago today wow. and it's had a real impact on me having them both gone and yeah, I've been writing you know and they it was an enormous Italian family and just um, you know the difference in the generations and just uh, there were a couple of little secrets in there particularly about my dad that a lot of people didn't even really know about so I'm writing about it and I mm. think it's it's telling it's topical and it's uh, interesting but it's also very very cathartic it's really right. a nice whether whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction. I think, and I wouldn't even know how to do a screenplay, but for me, a novel uh, came very naturally. So mm. maybe if you get out there and try it, you might find that it, it just sort of comes naturally to you. Yeah, I'll try. I'm, I'm, you know, I really want to try, actually, because uh, I wrote this movie 15 years ago, and I and a lot of people that, that um, uh, read the movie, they suggest to me, it's like, hey, why don't you write the novel? Because it's such a beautiful story. And then and, you can you draw know. from that for the screenplay. Yeah, and what the is screenplay is already written. Okay. So I already have the screenplay, but um, what but is now, it about? It's about like a matador, like a bullfighter, and hmm. uh, it's kind of like loosely based on uh, on uh, this guy's story, life story, and uh, but it's uh, it's um, it's it's about like this uh, this this I I love animals and I love nature, so it's about this this bullfighter that at the end of his journey understands the importance of respecting mother nature and so and the side the ultimate decision is like not to kill and he gives up the bullfighting yeah but it also he, well i don't want to give away the story but you know like it's uh he he ends up saving the bull let's let's put it that way so it's it's kind of like a, a journey of this bullfighter uh, and through um, dealing with his inner demon, demons and um, and give up bullfighting and saving, rescuing these animals. Did actually. it come from anything personal in your own life, or this is just something mm. you thought of? No, it's just a story that I thought about it like uh, many, many years ago because I do love animals. And uh, growing up, I I used to like love bullfighting like as a as a as an image you know like as a as a as a show 
you know, growing up in Italy, you know, bullfighting. Because they certainly didn't Spain, do it there, or, did they? I mean, they, they did it next they door in it. Spain. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But but then growing up, I I really, I really like. I felt sorry for these animals, like to be taunted and then. I did you know, too. It seems so cruel, and I it's never very cruel. and I never went, and I never wanted to go. I I've never been went to Spain, either, and I so. don't want to go uh, wherever they do them. I have no interest. Right, they do it. I think in Spain also in South America or Mexico. They do it. I understand it's a challenge for the bullfighter. It's it's courage and and but you don't have to kill the animal. Maybe you can just. You I know, think it's incredibly cruel to do know. that. Yeah, exactly. What's, where's the challenge there? Explain right. that. No, to the me. challenge is like the challenge like of fighting with uh, with a bull, uh, but. Uh, the thing is, like, you don't have to, it's like boxing, you know, you don't have to kill each other. You can still challenge each other, but, you know, it's not like at the end of the match, I'm going to kill you or you're going to kill me. So, look, it's, the bull had no choice. Exactly. The, the guy was, you know, five against put one, in there and, you know? and, you know, he had no choice about this. About yeah, this he has fight, no so. choice because I think also, also like the bullfighter is like the matador is like, it's not by himself. He's not one on one. He's got the picadores, which is like the guys on a horse and, you know, helping him with the spears and everything. So it's not like it's never really one on one. I have to tell you, I'm visualizing this as a film and I'm visualizing how it can be shot. It actually sounds very beautiful. You're drawing me in here. So mm -hmm. that's a good thing. No, no, it's a beautiful movie. A really I think it's a beautiful. really beautiful movie. It's got the love triangle. It's got uh, it's got a. Uh, it's got all the elements to be like a romantic movie, but also with a, with a strong message. It's mm -hmm. like, let's end this, you know, because it's, it's brutal. It is. Oh, thank you so much for being here. I really enjoyed having you. You're lovely. Thank you. Very kind, handsome, and very, very successful and talented. So thank you very thank much you. for joining me thank you. today. And it was another really fun show. And I guess we didn't hear from Misty, did we? Our producer. Do we have a little quick picture of her that we can put up there? There you go. She's the most adorable lady now for all i know she had the baby and she didn't think to call me right away but um <laughs> we'll let you know next time we're back here because by then we will know right right okay uh good luck misty call me and let me know what's going on and thank you everybody for being here for another really fun edition of what's up with cobalt and friends